the, the analysis, the investigation, and also the activism around this is oriented towards a human or, or legal rights framework. Uh, who owns the land? Do, does this community own the land? Do the people living on this particular plot own the land? Are they squatters? Uh, and you, you can quickly get into the complexities of land tenure, land titling systems in Cambodia, which are which are inconsistent and problematic on a, on a large number of fronts. Um, th that said, um, that's a, an incredibly important perspective, but there were quite a few people who had, who had looked at that. And there was very little actual sort of hard social science um, um, research on it, so that was what I, I intended to do. All right, most of you are not academics, so I'll spare you the methodology section in, in great detail. I will say that this was, I, I did not do a survey, I did not talk to a huge number of people, and I cannot make any claims around, uh, any statistical claims. I cannot tell you what percentage of people um, did really, I landed on their feet, or what percentage of people ended up outside of the city, or what percentage of people here or there. I don't have that. What I, what I did instead was in-depth narrative interviews with a small number of people to get a very rich and nuanced um, story. We simply asked them, what happened to you after you were evicted? Tell us the story. Um, and so it was very detailed, uh, but a fairly small number of people that we had. Uh, we ended up with over a thousand pages of transcribed text. So. Um, in a nutshell, um, the forced evictions had profound impacts on housing, well-being, livelihoods. Um, however, and I, I think this is not always brought out in some of the, uh, the popular press or, or, or commonly read articles, um, I found that the nature and degree of harm was very differentiated among different groups of people. Different people were affected in different ways. Um, and there is a lot of diversity in experiences, but there are also some very common patterns and trajectories, and by understanding that, maybe we can help develop some more nuanced and targeted policies and programs. Uh, and then psychosocial adjustment coping, everything was ultimately embedded in socioeconomic circumstances, so that was, and that, that should come as no surprise in a country like Cambodia with tremendous poverty. So some of the key factors that determined this were the decision on whether or not to remain in the city center versus to go out to the periphery of the city, or in some cases perhaps even to the home commons. Whether or not people worked in informal employment, were self-employed, you know, um, selling snacks, working as motor dogs, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, compared to those who had jobs in shops or offices or something like that. Um, the strength, location, and concentration of their social supports. Uh, ultimately, when they're displaced, their overwhelming support system is their social networks. Who do they know? Who can help me get through this period? Who can I borrow money from? Who can help, who can help me find a new place to live? That kind of thing. Um, we see again and again, and this would, uh, that some people Everyone they know lives in their neighborhood, and so when the neighborhood is, is, is destroyed, they don't know anyone who can help them anymore. Whereas we found some other ones who had only very weak ties in the neighborhood, and um, they, they, they did much better. Um, so that was, a, that was a huge, huge factor. Um, and the presence or absence of NGO or other assistance, and then the compensation package. And I want to cover the, the compensation packages in particular. Um, there is no set policy in Phnom Penh or Cambodia where everybody, you know, automatically follows the same the same policy. Um, however, the pattern is, uh, particularly in Phnom Penh, is that um, a company purchases, you know, a plot of land, and then there is a single compensation package. A, uh, that is given to everyone who is eligible. And that is, there is some variation from lo location. I, I talked to 
women displaced from five neighborhoods. But generally, homeowners get a new house in a location that is quite far outside the city, about 20 kilometers away or so. Although I did find one exception uh, in Boray Kema where they built an apartment building nearby. Um, so in some cases, homeowners get a compensation house far away um, or a cash settlement, which they can usually choose either the house or the cash settlement. Cash settlement is usually eight to ten thousand um, dollars. Those who are not eligible for compensation, who are not deemed to be homeowners, um, do not get any compensation other than sometimes there were small compensation packages for, for moving expenses or something. And many times um, these relocation camps are set up far outside the city. Are, are any of you familiar with these camps? Just in the news, all right. Um, the, the, the conditions in the camps How's this audio working, by the way? Is this better than just chat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, there are these relocation camps outside the city where normally renters are taken to. Um, and they may be given very small plots of land, like four by six meters square. But there's no, um, there's no shelter, there's no toilets, there's no water, there's no sanitation. Um, conditions are very, very bad. They're just sort of barren, desolate spots outside of the city. Uh, and most people don't go to these camps. These camps are filled with the people who have nowhere else to go. Um, but they're not usually homeowners. So an important factor to consider is that calling for more or more equitable compensation for property that is being um, confiscated uh, doesn't actually help renters because the renters don't own the land anyway. However, the renters have no place to go. So they often end up in these relocation camps. Um, yeah, again, some, sometimes people are excluded from compensation e either because they don't own the land. There are also reports of, um, shall we say, in, in inaccuracies and inefficiencies in terms of who, who received the land. And a lot of people were afraid of participating in activism um, in, because they were afraid that they might not be, they might not get a compensation package if they did that. Um, there were also a lot of reports of ghost names of people who did not live in, live in the neighborhood but some compensation packages. So I want to, there, there were basically, everybody fell into four trajectories. And the first three, uh, livelihood harm, asset harm, and then the, the combination of both asset and livelihood harm. The women who I talked to, they had very consistent stories within that group. You know, um, pretty much all the livelihood harm group had a very consistent story. There were different versions of it, but they had a lot of similar characteristics and a, a very predictable um, story. Um, the final one, the, the, the group that had neutral or improved outcome, um, completely diverse all over the map, idiosyncratic. And I'm going to go through each of these four. Um, the livelihood harm group, this was found uh, among people whose livelihoods were tied to their community. They were often quite poor, often renters uh, who did not own the houses that they lived in. And they primarily worked in the informal sector, and their whole livelihood capacity was grounded in where they lived. This is where their customers were, whether they sold snacks. A lot of them were involved in basic services like washing, um, washing laundry, uh, selling coffee, a lot of small informal sector issues. And um, they ended up on the outskirts of the city, often with a new compensation um, house. Uh, but they were ending up in areas where there was no viable customer, there was no viable economy, there was nobody to sell noodles to anymore. Like I talked to one woman who was like, 
I, I make the most delicious Chinese noodles. Everybody, everybody in Rafia wanted my noodles, but I came here, and she opened up a noodle shop, and there were just no customers. So what's happening is the, the self-employed people are going outside the city, and their their livelihoods are collapsing, and then they have nowhere. They, they have very few options anymore. Um, even when they end up with a compensation house that is adequate. Um, and here's an example of a, of a story. It's not the same. My husband can't profit after paying for gasoline. There's no hope. In Dacre Home, I could sell meatballs and fertilized duck eggs on Saturday and Sundays. What about here? There's no Saturday or Sunday. There's nothing. Um, and what this quote highlights is that people who work in the informal sector, the, the, the poor, um, they need to be in a location where they're near other people who buy those goods and services. It's not, she's not asking for a weekend for herself. She's asking for where are the people who enjoy weekends. This woman, they, her family sort of barely made ends meet during the work week, and then weekends was all profit, but that was where they got the extra money to invest in the children's education, um, putting away for a new motorbike, things like that. I mean, they were, they were just barely making ends meet during, the, during Monday through Friday, but man, that weekend made a whole world of difference to them financially. And they're now she's living with, some, with people where there's no weekend. Um, where, where did you find that weekend? Uh, and I wanted to pick out a particular example of a narrator from this. Uh, a woman named Chan Tong, who had lived in Dayton Home, um, she had been a renter. She was a bit originally left along a roadside. The company had taken them outside of the city where uh, the homeowners had gotten compensation housing, but the renters were excluded and they ended up in an encampment along a roadside, essentially homeless. Um, and they were there for a number of months and then the company uh, set up a relocation camp and basically removed everyone to the camp where they were given small uh, plots of land. She had gotten some money from um, an NGO doing micro grants to start up a business and have a small stall in the makeshift market selling fruits and vegetables, and rice and things like that. Very basic. Very basic. Um, but she went through this litany of one desperate coping strategy after another. Um, first they borrowed from all their friends and families. They sold their assets. They started scavenging for food. They started up the business. The business wasn't making any profit. Everybody else was hungry, so they were all buying things on credit from her. And, um, you know, it, the whole thing was collapsing. She borrowed from pawnbrokers, her little plot of land, her property deed was the only thing she had. Her son was trafficked to Thailand. Um, the whole family was deteriorating into fighting and uh, domestic violence issues. Um, her health was collapsing. She developed chronic health problems, teary eyes. Her eyes were running and red and teary all the time. And she was just at the complete end of the road. I don't know what to do since I can't make money, so I persevered in pain. And that was, that was it. She had nowhere to go. Um, the second group was actually quite different. And these, these people tended to be harmed more in terms of assets than in livelihoods. These were the better off people, the homeowners, um, who, who did receive compensation packages or new house, and they tended to have either some, um, some skills that made them employable or often office jobs which they held on to. So their livelihoods were not so tied in the community and the neighborhood. Um, um, so although the compensation packages were less than the value of their properties, I mean, they could buy a comparable property and could not bend for $10,000, um, they were, they, they were food, they had enough to eat. Um, they normally bought a place far outside the city because that's the only thing you can buy for $10,000, had a very long commute. Um, and, um, but I, I don't want to say that they, you know, they weren't harmed. You know, they, you, you found people with 
very deep ties to their communities and their properties, and the property usually symbolized everything that they had since the war. Um, you know, when I, when I moved to uh, I moved here. In 1982, with my husband, and we had nothing, and we got this little plot of land. And for literally, you know, a couple of decades, everything that the entire extended family had worked towards, you know, building up what had been a shack into a home, and this home symbolized everything that they had come and to, and they often had very, very deep and meaningful ties with their neighbors, um, who would also overcome the warriors here. And uh, to lose this was absolutely devastating. Um, in a way, hello. Okay. So the loss of it went far above and beyond the fact that hey, I have a property and I know because I'm educated and I have a job in an office, I know that the the land that my house is on is worth forty thousand dollars, and you guys gave me ten. So that, they feel outraged about, about that. Um, but the loss is, is something other than the economic loss as well. Um, but I just wanted to highlight an example of that a woman named Dali. She was extraordinary. She was just like a fantastic individual, wonderful to talk to. I couldn't believe, you know, she didn't, she didn't know us and she just told us her life story in remarkable detail. She had been an orphan of the Pol Pot regime, um, ended up in an orphanage and then in a Thai refugee camp. Um, nobody had helped her when she was young. There was, there was no reason that this woman would be expected to get ahead, but she had managed to largely self-educate herself. She had learned English. She spoke at great length. Um, she was very grateful she had a job in the early 80s working for a foreigner who paid for her to go to English lessons so she could learn English. And um, despite having a sixth grade education, could speak English, could read and write, and she had um, a good job as a human resource officer at a company. She, she'd gone very far with um, a, a very troubled background. She had bought her house for $400. Um, when she was about 20, and she was about 34 when we interviewed her, and she was, she was, she was devastated. But she did have a job. Um, so this is a very different situation and a very different group than, say, Chantan, which was, you know, where they didn't have enough to eat and were selling their children to Thai fishing vessels. And I just wanted to put this quote up here. When I had my home house, even though it was not very nice, it was a shelter that I had for my children's warmth. It was a small house, but it was ours. And when it happened like that, if it were you, would you be chewed up? We worked very hard saving money to build a proper house to live in, and finally, they, they took it. And she's saying some very interesting things here. This is important, more important than our property. They came to force us like animals. So this brings back a lot of pain and suffering um, in, in other ways. But this is also a group of people who has different interests and different social ties and different economic ties than um, the, the first group, which was harmed largely in terms of livelihoods. Um, there is also a group of people, and these were usually families where everyone worked together in a business in their neighborhood. So these were not poor um, people in the informal sector working as moto docs and um, you know dishwashers and things like that. These were usually people who had a, 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 a prosperous business. The, the whole extended family worked in this business, and it was based in the neighborhood. They usually lived upstairs, and they usually had um, full property uh, title and deeds. So what happens is when they lost their property, they also lost the entire family's livelihood at the same time. And um, these people usually had lived in their neighborhood for years and years and years. Everyone they knew lived in the neighborhood and didn't have social ties beyond it, and they didn't have economic ties beyond it, and they lost everything. And they ended up um, just completely wiped out, completely wiped out. Um, 
in his example of, of one woman, um, before we used to sleep on a mattress, we had an air conditioner and fans. If we still had our dignity, if we had money, we couldn't live in a poor people's place, but these days we have to be poor people. So these were people who are returning to poverty and usually, again, undoing all the progress that the family had made since the warriors. And then finally, um, I had a group of people who um, had neutral or improved outcomes after forced eviction. And I should say that I did purposive sampling. I was trying to find people who represented different, different stories and different experiences. And I was particularly trying to find um, ones who had more positive outcomes precisely because then we can build policies and programs that play to people's strengths. What do they have? Of the people who do well, what, what is it about them that help them? Um, what can we learn from them compared to the ones who didn't? Um, one thing I found about this group was it was just all over the map. It was, um, um, the rest of them had sort of internally consistent stories within the groups. This one was uh, really random. Lots of different examples, lots of different issues, and it seemed to be a lot of accidents, actually. Um, but I, I wanted to highlight a couple of characteristics of the people who did well. One is that uh, overwhelmingly their livelihoods were unaffected or they easily found new jobs in new locations. Secondly, they had solid social support that was not tied to their neighborhoods. Um, or they uh, found new benefactors quickly in some cases. Um, like this one, this was an old woman who um, lived alone. She was, a, she was an elderly widow. Her only son had died. Her daughter-in-law neglected her. And she had nothing to eat except for what the neighbors gave her, and they were very kind. And she ate all her meals with them. Um, Limited personal or financial investment in house or community. Some people don't have strong ties to their neighborhoods. For some people, it's a it's a convenient place to live. Their friends are elsewhere. Their their uh, family is elsewhere. And if they have a crisis, um, it, not everybody in their network is having the same crisis simultaneously. Um, availability of new housing nearby. This was huge. Um, in general, and especially for those who work in the informal sector, going to remote locations was unsustainable in terms of livelihood capacity. And those who stayed within the city center who managed to find another, another place to live nearby did a lot better. Um, some simply had other bigger issues in their lives than their housing and their accommodation. Um, and again, these are usually people like Paula here, who, uh, who found a uh, new, she was a renter who had found new accommodation nearby. The eviction was ultimately kind of a, a big stressful mess at the time, and she had to move in a hurry, and she had to find a new place to live, and blah, blah, blah. But, I mean, it was kind of a hassle that ended. Um, uh, her life was unaffected. And she had bigger problems in her life. Her husband was very violent. She was HIV positive. Her husband had full-blown AIDS. Um, there were bigger, bigger issues in her life than um, the house. Uh, and then we have miscellaneous idiosyncratic reasons. And like I said, lots of random examples, like Dina. Dina was a terrific person to interview. She was a graduate student. Um, she had been living at Bunkok Lake with her brother, who was quite strict. Um, and she was very frank about um, how the displacement harmed her brother and his wife and their family. But as for her, this gave her the big excuse to get her own apartment on campus, away from her brother and away from supervision. And she was just having a party. She was having a great time. <laughs> So you find people who, for some reason, you know, um, and there was another one as well, uh, who, she was the only one who, she actually gave me this speech of, like, thank you to the company. 
Um, <laughs> even though her, her livelihood was actually reduced a lot, but it was because her, her husband had a, a lot of karaoke bars he used to hang out at at Bangkok Lake, and um, they had less money, and they were in a remote location, and he just couldn't get into trouble like he used to. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you, you find these kind of random reasons, <laughs> but um, it's not nothing that you can build a public policy around, but um, thought I'd acknowledge that. Um, and so I wanted to flag, in terms of a resilience model, um, the story of Sokan. Um, I would like to say she was not typical. The other examples that I brought on for the first three trajectories were all typical examples. So Khan was not typical, but then there was no typical story within this group. What So Khan had was the most clear sort of distinctive bundle of characteristics and lessons around resilience. Um, and these were, again, strong social network beyond her neighborhood. So Khan was a very devout Mormon, and all of her friends were affiliated with the Mormon church. All of her, she also had um, effectively health insurance through, through the Mormon church because if someone got sick, their hospital bills would be paid for and their funerals would be paid for. So she had some basic insurance, she had a, a very tight, highly supportive social network that was not connected to her neighbor. Um, this was a huge thing. She prioritized business opportunities over housing, and I think this is one of the most important lessons that I learned. Um, most of the people who moved put their money and their efforts and their resources into find, finding a new house, setting up a new house, painting it, you know, get, you know, doing the kitchen, um, and especially those who had been very attached to their former properties. Nobody wanted to move to an inferior house. It was very, very, very important for them to have a house that was at least as nice as the one they left. But what happened would be that they would overextend themselves financially setting up the new house and the new household. And then the livelihoods were not the same as they had been. And then they were trapped in debt. They couldn't pay back the debt they already borrowed money from everybody they could borrow money for, and then they were very trapped. Um, so Khan, out of my entire sample, is the only one who focused on setting up her business first, not her house. Um, she had come from an extremely poor background in the province, had been a rubber plantation worker when she was younger. Um, they, she was a renter, so she got no compensation at all. So she moved to another uh, neighborhood with very cheap rent, like she had had. Um, and uh, but she went into an extremely, extremely basic housing situation while she sorted out the family business issue. And what she found was that her new location, um, they just couldn't make enough money. Um, to live there long term, so it was very good that they hadn't invested in a house or even setting up a house. And she made some very astute business decisions. She took the whole thing as sort of a bit of an opportunity to revamp her business, did what could be called some market research, trying to figure out where she could do her business better. And this wasn't a fancy business. Her whole, her whole family had a business um, roasting yams and sweet potatoes and selling them. So some people roasted and some people sold. Um, you know, they were making $10 a day profit, you know, the household. Um, she found a better neighborhood for business and she moved again on her own. Um, and she was doing very well. Um, and the important lesson here is that when you have strong livelihoods, you can fix up your house later, but the reverse is not true. The people who overextended themselves setting up the house and then had their livelihoods collapsed had no alternatives. Um, yeah, and she had a matter-of-fact attitude. She was gonna. She was just like I rolled with lots of punches before and alluded to some grave difficulties in her life when she was a rubber plantation worker. So, 
Here's an example. Um, after moving from React VA, it was expensive. We couldn't sell or do anything, so I looked for a new, new way. We moved a second time. Uh, we came by ourselves, and it cost a lot, but that's okay. My children are doing fine. My business is going well. God blesses me and provides me. And that was sort of the summary of her, her narrative. Um, I wanted to flag a particular note on renters because renters are often the most poor and most vulnerable in the community. Um, and they're the most poor, they're the most vulnerable, they're the most reliant on the, on the neighborhood for their livelihoods often. Um, and they're excluded from compensation, compensation packages and a lot of the effort that goes into improving Conditions for people who are evicted in Phnom Penh or elsewhere in Cambodia tend to focus on compensation packages for homeowners, and that excludes many of those who are the, uh, among the poorest and the most vulnerable. However, um, some other renters just have very superficial ties to their neighborhood, and it wasn't a very, it wasn't a meaningful experience beyond the hassle of moving. So it's a very complicated and contradictory group that I think um, those who are working on, on policies and programming need to look at this in a very nuanced and strategic way. Um, I'm going to skip over a couple Yeah, uh, desperate now, active coping strategies, risky work, family strife, separation of households. This often happens with the people who end up far from the city because um, because they can't. Every, not everyone in the household can support themselves, so people end up separating, and this leaves particularly uh, elderly and women with small children very vulnerable because they're reliant on remittances from people working elsewhere and those tend to become less and less over time. All right, so I'm gonna wrap up with a couple of recommendations and then we can have questions. One is fairly obvious that we need to have better compliance with Cambodia's own land laws and processes. Um, and part of that is better measures to improve land tenure security, um, particularly for women, and poor and people who are illiterate. They have a lot of trouble with documents because they couldn't read them. Um, clearance of, ur of urban neighborhoods might be considered for public goods, but we need to really question whether uh, it's important to do this for commercial development. Um, compensation homeowners at full market value for their properties. Um, and then more strategic and targeted assistance to renters. Um, but I think one of the biggest take-home lessons is that the overall focus on housing and shelter needs to be stepped back from, um, and we need to be looking at broader urban planning policies that um, encourage low-income housing within the city center where people have access to jobs and customers and clients. Um, and we need to be prioritizing livelihood capacities rather than focusing on just the house itself. Uh, it's, just, it's just too narrow. And um, disaster risk reduction frameworks, which are often used in disaster contexts to look at um, household vulnerabilities, coping capacities, and resilience. These frameworks are out there, and I think that there's a lot of applicability towards uh, forced eviction context. Questions? Good job. <laughs> you, you touched on uh, urban housing planning there, and also further down the slide, also. Uh, transportation policy of the town. So are you familiar with master planning for Phnom Penh with respect to housing and transportation as well? Is there a master plan? Oh, um, I'm, I'm not sure what the absolute grid status on this is, but there's, uh, I'm not sure, I, I, I don't have the most current up-to-date stuff on that. Um, but I think that 
transportation. Public transportation in a comprehensive way is still quite uh, a number of years down the road. And frankly, that would really, really, really help connect um, places where poor people can afford to live to places where they can actually earn a living. I think that would actually be really, really critical. Um, but does anybody know if that's planned or going to happen anytime soon? I don't think uh, that seems to be part of the problem you know, of the enforcement and development is completely an arctic outside the, the main central business district. There seems to be a lack of a, an actual master plan, both for transport, housing, social housing, and beyond. Yeah, I'm not sure. What would you specifically propose? Uh, Assuming a shift from housing to livelihood, what would you specifically propose um, as a mechanism to address the um, I think that embedded, there's a lot of things that are embedded within that, none of which are easy, sort of quick bullets. Um, and I would like to say that transporting people to areas with garment factories is not a solution unless you happen to have five 19-year-old unmarried daughters. Um, a lot of these people are ending up in garment factory areas, but because the garment factories, uh, the work available is gender-specific and age-specific. It's, uh, it's not a household, um, it's not a household income-generating option. Um, and so the household ends up separating. So I, I did wanna, I did wanna emphasize that point. Um, People who, you know, the, the, the working urban poor tend to do best in mixed income environments, mixed income locations, because then they have access to clients, customers, credit, um, etc. Um, and we can go back to Jane Jacobs on some of this stuff. Um, um, so I think. Uh, rather than this emphasis on let's get luxury development and high-end commercial development and all of, all of that, we need to develop some, some policies and some strategies that are designed to maintain some affordable housing districts within, within the city. And, I, and, I, and I, I know you're looking for something more specific than that. Um, and I don't have an answer in a nutshell. <laughs> in two sentences. Um, but uh, access to affordable housing in, in the central city and in mixed income environments. Because what happens when there's just concentrations of poverty, um, in general, but also with these, these women who are evicted, these families, um, they, when they moved together, they maintained strong social support, but they, they're, they're, the economic supports that were embedded in their sort of relationships collapsed because there simply wasn't enough money circulating in the local economy. Um, so you can't sell coffee to your neighbor if your neighbor also doesn't have any coffee. Um, and so every, everything was just collapsing. And I saw a number of actual uh, of NGO projects as well, um, micrograms and things like that. And none of them, um, none of them were sustainable. None of them were working because they just weren't any customers or clients. The one example was uh, Cambodian Knits. Have you seen Cambodian Knits? It's by Dual Slime, it has a little shop. Um, and uh, Cambodian Knits is a social enterprise where they knit puppets and toys and things like that. They're sold in the shops here. And they're also sold in some stores in Canada. And um, they were quite active in Bored Pila, which had a huge concentration of HIV positive families as well. And so when those families were moved, uh, the Cambodian Knits project moved with them. Um, but that, that's not really a, a sustainable model because that only worked because there was, you know, somebody buying all their projects. You know, they would, they would go once a week and buy all, you know, buy all the toys that had been knitted and all the puppets and provide more supplies. So there was, there was somebody, there was somebody with a long-term tie that was supporting that. They weren't actually 
finding a niche within the local economy or the local community. But that was the only one that was um, at all working. Uh, right you know the numbers, the many sets of numbers, how many people displaced, and how your four categories would break out? No, I, I did qualitative research, so um, I can't answer that question because I didn't do a random sample. <laughs> um, <laughs> How hard was it to find How hard? It, it, it was actually not that hard to find happy ones. Um, it wasn't hard, but we put a lot of effort into it as well. Like, you know, we would interview somebody and then like, do you know somebody who's doing well? I mean, we were, at, we were, I was looking at for a number of things. I was looking at a, a range of ages, a range of livelihoods, a range of sort of household composition, uh, different compensation packages. It's very clear to make sure that I covered all the different compensation possibilities to see if that was a factor. I didn't find that the specific compensation package was better or worse. But what was huge was the was the library thing. And like I said, um, staying in the city works better if you're if you're self-employed. So um, I I do think that in terms of policies and programs, what we can do to help people find alternative housing, um, helping people find alternative housing, alternative low-income housing closer to the city is probably better than having them in concentrations farther away, even though it's easier to deliver rice every other week out there. So maybe a case management approach, but we've got, um, that involves a lot of resources and a lot of human resource capacity as well. It would be, it would be hard. You know, I'm, I'm very surprised when I was uh, as a journalist in year 2000, it's almost 14 years ago. Uh, for, 14 years ago, I interviewed the, the Phnom governor, he said that 100,000 people will be kicked out of the city. So 14 years ago, at that time we had a lot of funding from the NGO and we did not do anything to prepare. Only just in the past five years that we do a lot, a lot of activity. So if we do something 14 years ago, I think it's not so much a dramatic like right now today. Yeah. All these people from this area, where do they come from? <laughs> it's a, let, let him say it, you know, it's a government policy <laughs> to kick out a hundred thousand people. It's in hundred thousands. This whole area. This whole area. Three of my neighborhoods were that area. So <laughs> <I'm> Yanmo. <laughs> yes, Yanmo. <laughs> Sorry, uh, one, one of the main um, reasons that made some regulars better off than the others or worse off than the others. It was, um, I, I thought it had a lot of characteristics that would be difficult to design policies and programs around, like the extent to which their friends and families also lived in the neighborhood. Those who had friends and families who lived somewhere else had a lot more help. Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, my sister gave me food until we got back on our feet kind of stories. If they have friends and families doing okay who don't live in the neighborhood, that was a very big deal. Um, I mean, it's hard to go around the city and say, you know, like, make sure you have lots of friends in other neighborhoods. But um, it is something that you could screen for in a, in a survey or in a case management um, intake interview to assess the, the strength and quality of people's social networks. Um, and the renters, yeah, like I said, the, the, the social networks, whether or not they were concentrated in the neighborhood and whether or not their income was concentrated in the neighborhood. Some renters have very superficial ties to their neighborhood. They don't really know their friends. They're, I'm sorry, they, they know their friends, but their friends are elsewhere. They don't know their neighbors. Their jobs aren't there. It's not that big a deal. But the renters who were completely embedded in their neighborhoods were white. Making the location decision for compensation housing, uh, and is that is that an influential uh, decision? Is it something that you want? Um, potentially, potentially. Um, um, I think generally, I mean, like I said, it's it's a case by case basis. You know, so there's not a consistent policy that's always followed within the city. Um, but generally, it seems that they're buying large tracts 
of land um, somewhere where there's a big tract of land available for sale, and that's about 20 kilometers out, um, and building, you know, Khmer style row houses. You know, just a, a big neighborhood of row houses, and people are like, Here, here's your new row house. Um, they're cement. Um, they were, at least the ones that I saw, had been given row houses that had unfinished interiors, including no no tiling or painting, uh, no interior walls, that kind of thing. So it actually cost quite a lot to sort of fix it up, um, fill in the kitchen. And then in the, in the locations outside the city, to connect electricity and water can be very expensive. It can be like $200 in some cases. So people were really, really um, going into debt and actually strapped setting up the house to make it livable. That said, um, even if the house had been more livable, they still wouldn't have been able to make that Chinese needle shop work. So um, I, I don't think, while, while there are some serious issues around the housing, um, I don't think that solving the, the issues around the housing helps anything but the house. You know, um, It doesn't solve the other livelihoods factor. Um, in terms of influencing the locations within the cities, um, that's actually a complicated question, and I could uh, refer you to an excellent uh, urban planning study on that. Um, the alternative that's been practiced in the city has been to put up apartment blocks. Like, let's say you buy up, oh, this area. <laughs> And um, so what would happen would be the, the commercial developer would develop the property, but the people who are eligible for compensation would be built an apartment building, often a high-rise apartment building. And then they're given apartments. Um, now, I'm now quoting from somebody else's study because, um, because it didn't factor in so much into mine. One of my neighborhoods, Bore Pela, I, I interviewed two people who had gotten a compensation for apartment building within the city, um, and they both, those two examples were both doing were both doing a lot better in general. That said, based on this other study that was done, um, the apartment buildings that have been built have not been successful in maintaining affordable housing for families in the city who have been displaced, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that a lot of the people who work in the formal sector um, do so from their houses, and you can't sell things if you're on the fifth, if you're on the fifth floor wall. Um, you know, you need to have a ground floor that opens onto a street in order to have that basic house. So what happens is they're given those fifth floor walk-ups, and they, it, it, that space doesn't work for them because that's not how they use space, and they end up selling it. Um, I think this study said a lot of these higher apartments ended up being storage for people who had shops and they needed a, a nearby place to put a lot of goods. Um, and um, so that over time, um, the apartments are, people tend to leave them because they, because they, they find preferable places to live. So while it's a, it's a, better, it's a better strategy, it's a better short-term strategy, um, the, the experience in Pell Pen is that it hasn't worked very well um, long term in terms of maintaining affordable housing in the city. The other factor is like one of the women that I interviewed um, from Bray Kayla who ended up in the apartment. Um, this was a woman who had the domestic violence problems. She was HIV positive. Her husband, uh, uh, I saw him, he had Carposi sarcoma, so I, you know, I guess he had cold blood AIDS. And they had three little boys. And she got um, a top floor walk up, and you know her husband was too sick, and her boys were too small to go up that walk up. Um, and she was HIV positive too, and very conscious that she would not be able to live up that many stairs. And so what she had done was, while she got the apartment, she rented it out to somebody else and used that rental money to support her renting a different place that was on the ground floor for which everybody could reach. But um, without elevators, this is very limiting to elderly children and the disabled, and most households have several of those in them. And that's, that's um, 
that's a disadvantage of payments, as well as the livelihoods. Some families can't live in them because they can't all go. Or if they, or if they do live in them, they can't leave. as if everybody is all the same. And they're actually not. Um, for example, the renters who end up in these relocation camps where the conditions are, they're, they're really horrific. And I, I should say, I spent six years as a frontline humanitarian relief worker. I did Sierra Leone, I did the Balkans, I was, in, I was a first responder to the tsunami in Sri Lanka. I know what refugee camps look like. And, um, you know, uh, the, the conditions are absolutely appalling. Um, but there's a bit of going to those camps, taking pictures, looking at it, and then talking about fair compensation. But that's actually a different group of people. The homeowners would be getting fair, fair compensation. And a lot of the media reports sort of collapse these two worst case scenario groups together. Um, I also think that it's important to consider for, um, you know, for some of the activist approaches because, um, frankly, the renters are not going to stick their necks out so that their landlord can get more money. They're trying to figure out how they're going to feed and educate their children. Um, and so I think some of the lack of solidarity has to do with the fact that there's actually very different interests involved. Okay, thank you so much, Jonathan. And um, 
news guy here, but actually I just got an email from the Ms. Chido Sumura in the Sony CSY. And I'm from CMRP. I'm the vice president of CMRP UC. I'm also Penelope and Unisport Priscilla's uh, member as well. Referring to the Penelope master plan for the big people master plan, actually I tried to ask the governor as well. But he didn't try to directly answer my, my questions. So in recently, they just have the three years master plans, not in the 20 year or 10 year or 15 year. For example, in recently, there's, we all we all heard about the flood in Phnom Penh. Every year, we have flood programs. So I've been trying to ask the government when will we can end of the parts program. The answer is on 2020. And I ask, and I'm going to ask them, if you know about the master plan of 2020, there is no fucking Phnom Penh. Could you give me the master plan of the fort building or the land development in Phnom Penh for the whole project? He cannot be. So the basically of the land development in Phnom Penh is not just from the government's master plan, it's from the business owner plans. For example, in Bangkok, like the government didn't know too much about the master plan of the sugar group. But the sugar group decided first to fill the sand to the lake. And they try then they also know too much how much for the total of the expenditure. But actually the super group wanted to try to spend for the government around three or reach to four hundred million dollars. And the compensation that they pay for the, the bank house like is around eight thousand per family. That's why it's made it, you know they they they, they cannot satisfy with this the the compensation. So what I can be share today I just would like all of you, if you have any good idea or you can comment to the to our opposition party, please uh, kindly send us an, an email or give us a contract. This is also another get improvement for the the program as well. That's the another the people. Yes, I have this uh, this idea for you. Thank you. Well, thank you again to Meta House. They allowed us to have this event for free, so please buy lots of drinks. <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you, Nico and Richard.